Doctors John and Julie Gottman are the founders of the Gottman Institute, where they apply more than four decades of research to help create and maintain relationship well-being all over the world. They are the recipients of the 2021 Psychotherapy Networker Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of their work revolutionizing couples therapy. Karen May, in addition to being one of my soul sisters, is an organizational psychologist with expertise in leadership development, change management, and executive coaching. For 10 years, Karen served as Google's Vice President of People Development. Please welcome them all. Stand by with Karen. I think Karen is having a little bit of a hard time, so I will, I will join um, before Karen gets here. Uh, let's see. So John and Julie, thank you so much for coming. Um, Karen May is your interviewer and she'll be here in a second. She's trying to follow the link over. So um, apologies uh, for the delay, um, but it's so, so good to have you. I know you spoke with some 2.0 um, a few years ago, kind of live in person. Right. And that was, um, uh, that was lovely. And I always learned so much from both of you. Um, you know, this time of COVID, I think, has been a challenge for a lot of people. And um, I'm wondering, um, as you work with people over COVID, what are some of the main themes and issues that you're seeing address? And I actually see now that Karen is here, <laughs> but maybe we could start just by uh, talking a little bit about some of the themes that you've noticed over the last year from the couples that you work with. Actually, Karen, I'm going to pass it over to you because you're now here. So take it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just switched computers and found you. Uh, <laughs> wonderful to see you. And, um, and I know you've been introduced to the audience, but I would say to those of you who are watching this video who don't know the Gottman's research and work, I really encourage you to take a look because the, the research that they've done has identified really critical um, factors that lead to the success or lack thereof of relationships, but not only the research, but then the very practical strategies for making changes in how you are with the people you love most. And it's, it's powerful. And I'm grateful for your work and grateful for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Really good work. It, it is. It can be a little bit like looking in a slightly uncomfortable mirror, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Take that as a cautionary note, but so important and really, really helpful. So um, I wanted to begin by just acknowledging the obvious and we're all living in, in this world. So this doesn't, this point doesn't need belaboring, but we have been collectively as a, as a human race, living in a varying forms of isolation for the last year. And many people are finding themselves in a smaller space without the ability to come and go, without the, um, the ability to have sort of the regular distractions in other parts of life and really forced to be with the people with whom we live. And for some people, this has been a time of serious suffering of financial losses, professional losses, and devastating personal losses and death. Um, for other people, this has been a surprising time with unexpected um, pleasures. But no matter what one's circumstances, um, this has been a very unique um, and a very unique period of time. And I'm wondering if we can just start by you know hearing a bit from you about what you're observing with your clients and your um, colleagues, as you look at what's happening to people's relationships during this period of time? One of the things I think that we are seeing, I know I've been seeing this clinically, is that uh, it's as if the relationships are under a magnifying glass in the sense that uh, distressed marriages and relationships are really suffering. They're suffering in much more extreme terms. And happy relationships, interestingly enough, are really enhancing with the together time, uh, more relaxation a little bit because uh, they're not having to drive through rush hour traffic every day. You know, that makes a big difference in relationships. <laughs> and so, 
The distress, though, is really what has been very upsetting, I think, for both of us. Um, we're seeing much more domestic violence. We're seeing more hostility, more emotional abuse, more uh, attempts at cutting off from one another rather than uh, connecting with one another. Uh, and couples really aren't equipped, unfortunately, with the tools they need to sustain the stress that they've been going through and to stay connected in a positive way. So as a result, um, over the course of the year, we've been really seeing the quality of distressed marriages get worse and worse over time. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, yeah, it's kind of like uh, the fault lines that uh, our problems in a relationship have gone through a major earthquake. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been a lot of damage and, and people are bewildered about what to do about it, how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And for others, uh, especially the two of us, our relationship has gotten better. Uh, it's more peaceful. Uh, priorities have really changed. And, and we don't want to go back to the way it used to be, where life was an endless to-do list. <laughs> Uh, we want more mindfulness in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us have really undergone major changes. Yeah, it, it seems like it's almost been an accelerant. The, this year has been an accelerant and depending on in which direction you might have been heading already, things have come to the surface that might not have, um, and we haven't had the um, escape, escape valves uh, that had often existed. Um, and so I, it's, um, it's with that in mind that, you know, we thought this was such an appropriate conversation for this conference, because whether you're living with um, a partner, a child, a parent, uh, you know, some, a friend, some combination of those, these patterns have been played out. And if the, you know, if we'd been isolated for two or three weeks, the, the, we might be talking about an incident, but in this case, we're talking about a year, which is plenty of time, I would imagine, for a pattern to develop mm -hmm. or patterns to develop. So as we're now at this place of people beginning to be vaccinated, states opening up, some people returning back to work, um, you know, sort of this, the, the ice is unfreezing a bit in our restor restoration or um, evolution into our next step. What kinds of things would you suggest that couples begin to think about at, to make sense out of the year that we've been through, um, regardless of in which direction they've accelerated? Uh, well, you know, I, I think one of the things that this isolation has created is a chance for introspection, a chance for reflection. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know a number of people uh, who are both clients and or uh, people I've connected with are really reprioritizing their values, their needs, their dreams. They're considering uh, I could have died this year if I'd had COVID or if I did get COVID, but somehow managed to uh, get up at the end of it. So what are my priorities now? So those kinds of conversations in which couples can really uh, create a sense of shared meaning out of this year, I think can promote what we call post-traumatic growth. And that's not a term that we coined. It's, it was by Richard Tedeschi who explored that concept. Right. Uh, and I think everyone really is suffering from some sense of trauma over the last year, um, <clears throat> either from loss, from grief, from uh, unemployment, you know, there's, there's been so many changes occurring over the last year, not to mention the last four years. So processing that trauma by describing what it was like uh, with your partner, what it felt like, how it changed you, where it lodged mm -hmm. in your body, in your mind, what was the worst part about it? 
what strength did you find in yourself to overcome it? Sharing those kinds of levels of experience with one another is a great opportunity to do one of the things that John and I have discovered in our work, which is the best couples create shared meaning together. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean having to have the same values, the same needs. What it means is communicating your own with your partner and having your partner ask you big open-ended questions to really understand the, the meat of what you're talking about uh, and why it's so important to you. So this experience has allowed us that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I also think that um, we've seen in our country, two vastly different templates for how to be a human being. We've seen the Trump administration uh, full of suspicion and xenophobia and racism, white supremacy. And now we see the Biden administration full of openness, care, empathy, the search for equality. And these two vast templates of how to be a human being in the world that also opens up the opportunity for exploration. And yeah, it's um, you're adding to not only have we been in a pandemic, but we've had the accelerant of the, the particularly in this country, although certainly in many others as well, this heightened um, political divide. Mm -hmm. and and these models, as you say, that in some cases, in some cases create opportunity and in other cases uh, can create an additional source of division within families and couples. And yeah. I think we've, we experience now an overwhelming sense of fragility, uh, how human relationships, how the economy is fragile, how connection can be fragile, mm -hmm. how, in fact, our democracy is fragile. Mm -hmm. and half of the American public would like to see the continuance of tyranny and the other half preserving democracy. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've got it. We've got an environment that is a stressful one yeah. uh, in which this kind of individual level work that we're doing exists. Right. So I'm, I really like the concept of the reprioritization. And, and as you're, as you were talking, Julie, I was thinking about the, um, one of the things that's unique about that is the intentionality that it implies that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than say, hey, the restaurants are open, <laughs> we've got our vaccines, back to normal, um, kind of stepping back into re returning to the previous life, there's, there's something about reprioritization, reprioritization that implies the, the opportunity to be quite conscious and intentional about the choices and what do we want to be part of our lives now in terms of what we're doing and activities, but also in terms of how we are together and how we are individually. Um, but I wanna, I wanna circle back for a minute to the distressed couples. You mentioned that in many cases, in some cases the couples who were distressed are experiencing even more of that. And um, in some case, cases quite severe. Mm -hmm. So coming out of maybe in a, as part of the reprioritization or in advance or in advance of that, how does a distressed couple find their feet to, you know, you, you can't sort of pretend that the year didn't happen, or I guess you could, um, but it wouldn't really work. So um, how do you find your feet in navigating back to a healthy or into a healthier place? That's a wonderful question, Karen. And I, I think um, one of the ways that we teach our couples and we work on ourselves as well, uh, it helps that we're married. So we have very good examples of how not to do things as well as to do things uh, is processing regrettable incidents. So, you know, the couples who've been distressed have often had really terrible emotionally injuring incidents that have come not from not caring for one another, but instead out of 
in part, the stress from COVID and the world at large infiltrating into the relationship, permeating their veins, and then coming out in horrendous words to one another or sometimes even physical blows. So those regrettable incidents end up festering inside of us. They're like abscesses and they don't go away. Uh, they really need to be opened up and explored and understood. And one of the mistakes that couples often make is when something like that happens, they'll apologize very quickly, right on the heels of the incident, before they've really understood the impact of the incident on their partner and as well on themselves. Neither has really listened in depth to the other. So John and I created um, a, uh, a tool called the aftermath of a regrettable incident. Uh, it is five different steps and uh, people can access it either through the Gottman Institute or we've also uh, created um, a platform called Gottman Connect online um, platform where the relationship coach gives a whole number of tools for helping sustain relationships. And this aftermath of a regrettable incident explores both what each person felt during the incident, what each person experienced in terms of their perception, their narrative. And people are given very, very clear instructions to not uh, explain their point of view through criticism, through contempt, through you were so mean, God, you were so selfish. What's the matter with you? All critical. Mm -hmm. But instead, learn how to describe themselves. I heard you say these words, and this is what I imagined was going on and what you felt towards me. I felt you know, abandoned, hurt, hate, hated even, you know. So uh, you explain your narrative while the other person is listening, taking notes, and then summarizing the salient points you made during your narrative and uh, giving a few words of validation. The third step is talking about triggers and triggers are huge. You know, a lot of people in this culture have been traumatized or, you know, not raised in perfection in their childhood. Nobody has been. And so we have leftover scar tissue from that early life. And those can, you know, scar tissue is brittle. And so when uh, fights or regrettable incidents occur in the present, it's as if that scar tissue is being poked and scar tissue is brittle. It tears easily. So describing to your partner what triggered you and what that enduring vulnerability is left over from much earlier experience in your life is really helpful for each of you to understand and to listen to and to really take note of. And after each person gets a chance to describe what got triggered for them as well as their narratives, then you take responsibility for whatever you regret saying or doing during the incident and apologize. Hopefully your partner accepts your apology. And then the fifth step is making a plan for how you can avoid something like this from happening in the future. So it's a very kind of structured tool that guides you by basically holding your hand and helping you speak to one another and listen to one another so that as you finish the process, that regrettable incident doesn't have the gravity and the pain, the anguish, that it had before you began the process. So that's one of the ways people can step back into a connected path together. And it's even a tool for greater understanding right. of how you went through those fault lines and what the fault lines are, those enduring vulnerabilities mm -hmm. Julie talked about. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a, a very powerful an important process and one that really honors people's experience and also allows people the opportunity to 
to accept responsibility and then to move forward. And, and I love the label of regrettable incident in a sense it, it um, it's so much better than, you know, the time that I exploded and shouldn't have. <laughs> it's, well, the uh, time that you were really mean to me. <laughs> you're a jerk, right. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great label. It strikes me that um, here we might be talking about a, a series of regrettable incidences over, over a year. And we know, you know, as things become patterns, they become more difficult to unlearn. Mm -hmm. And your last, your last step obviously allows an opportunity to be conscious about that for people who aren't used to having conversations like that, um, where, or where there's a lot of emotion tied to the experience and perhaps not as much safety at the end of this year as there might have been at the beginning. Mm -hmm. how, how would you advise people um, to initiate a conversation like that or to um, begin a process of exploration with a partner if things don't feel entirely safe? Mm. Good, good question. Um, first of all, I think um, prefaces are really important. And what I mean by that is uh, saying something like this, you know, that big fight that we had about a month ago that, you know, was so upsetting where we slept in different rooms at the end of it and we ended up yelling at each other. So a lot of we in that, right? Not you, but we. Um, well, how would you feel about just talking about that calmly without criticism, without contempt, without getting back into the fight again? Um, using a really kind of careful outline of describing our own experience and really working on listening to one another so we can put it behind us. Because I know for me, it was very upsetting. I hated to be so disconnected from you at the end of that. It felt terrible. I really want to reconnect with you. And this is standing in the way. You know, so in other words, you point out your intention, you want to reconnect, you use we rather than I or you, mm -hmm. I felt so hurt or, you know, etc. So it's we. And that preface of <clears throat> without criticism, without contempt, without getting back into it um, is a, a little bit of uh, a um, incentive to talk about it, a little bit of assurance that, uh, no, we're not going to go right back into the fight again. And it also really helps during this to um, say something like, let's, let's write things down that we say to each other, mm -hmm. or that, you know, I'll write down what you say, you write down what I say, so that um, the writing itself will help us to stay calmer. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> kind invitation. Yeah, yeah, I think, Karen, the other thing is and, that... Oh, wait. Ah. We'll have chocolate chip cookies and milk while we're ah. doing it. <laughs> That's kind of where I, where I was going to go, is that... Uh, there are a number of tools that we can offer couples that really have to do with opening positive things up, not just looking at conflict and what went wrong in the relationship. A lot of people uh, during times of stress like this pandemic and all the political upheaval we've experienced kind of shut down a lot of systems that have to do with fun, pleasure, uh, adventure, you know, there's been a lot less of that. You know, there's been, we've been in survival mode. And so part of what we can do, I think, is emerge from this uh, lockdown and start really opening up some of these systems mm -hmm. of enjoying sensuality, enjoying life, cooking interesting meals, enjoying the flavor, savoring uh, reopening and connection again, mm -hmm. and really nurturing those things that make a relationship fun and pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, John, and listening to you, um, it sounds like you're saying 
make sure to be, you know, not only process the regrettable periods or the regrettable incidents, but capture or recapture the things that bring joy to the relationship yeah, and, exactly. play and be, um, and because those may have gone by the wayside, those may not have felt possible, they may not have been possible. So it's, it's an opportunity to reclaim some of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a general opening that needs to happen. Uh, it's not just about, you know, sex, it's also about romance and play and fun and adventure and sensuality and just op an opening the way a flower opens when the sun comes out. And, you know, I think I've seen, we've seen a lot of shutdown uh, of our couples during this pandemic. Yeah. You know? And I imagine for, for many, shutdown felt functional or was functional at some level, given the conditions. Um, moving, shutdown to me also implies emotional distance. Yeah. And so that's one of your four horsemen. Uh, well, sort of, not, not exactly. Um, stonewalling. Oh, yes. He was flooded, meaning they're in fight or flight, and they draw inside themselves during a conversation uh, in order to self-soothe because their brains are offline, right? They're getting ready to run or fight and that doesn't help anything. Yeah. One of the, I wanted to mention, Karen, yeah, if it's okay, uh, speaking of connection, um, one of my favorite tools is what we call rituals of connection. So mm -hmm. build rituals of connection. And what that means is um, talking to your partner to co-design a way of mm -hmm. connecting in a, either a little way or a big, big way um, that is predictable that you can count on that feels really, really good for both of you. Mm -hmm. Some examples of that are how do you uh, wake up and say good morning? How do you reunite at the end of the day? How mm -hmm. do you eat dinner together? Uh, how do you uh, spend your time after dinner? Or how do you celebrate Easter or Ramadan or Passover or Christmas? You know, the, the bigger rituals, the birthdays. How do we want to move through time together in a way that captures and envelops our sense of shared meaning mm -hmm. that gives depth to our experience of connecting with one another mm -hmm. or also gives fun, gives play as, as John was talking about. How do we design these little moments where we want to connect in a predictable way to uh, care for one another and connect with one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so and, and so much about capturing the positive very intentionally going forward. That's right. So what can um what can one person do if the if if the conversation doesn't feel quite possible within a couple, but and if someone listening to us today says, well, I'm not quite ready to issue the invitation to process the regrettable incidents. And I'm not quite ready to issue the, let's sit down and talk about the rituals, but I'd like to start to um, make some change in my relationship. What in, in the area in which I have control, what, what advice would you give to the individual who wants to try to affect the, the unit? I love that. I love that. Um, so um, there's a lot of things that an individual can do to really, uh, create more safety, not only for themselves, but for their partner as well, for that kind of golden sphere between uh, partners that is the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. One is um, look for what your partner is doing right, not just what your partner is doing wrong. Look for what they're doing right, point it out to your partner and say, thank you. You know, I mean, especially when you've been together for years and years, we tend to just take for granted whatever our partners are doing. So uh, John, for example, my darling husband makes the best coffee in the universe. <laughs> he does it every single morning. And he's been doing that for over 
30 years now. So I thank him every single morning. Mm -hmm. And that thank you goes a long way towards him making it the next day, the next day. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. Another is um, try your best to deviate from saying, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you, 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 you. You know, when people hear that you uh, after a while attached to a negative phrase, they begin to think anytime my partner opens his or her mouth, it's going to be a criticism. Mm -hmm. And so they, they start flinching before you've even said anything. So change that pattern. Start saying um, what we call a softened startup if you need to bring up an issue which goes like this, I, starts with I, I feel something like I'm upset, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm hurt. You can say I'm furious even, but I feel something, that's one. About what, that's two. About what, what's the situation? I feel upset that the kitchen is a mess. I feel hurt that um, I wasn't called when you were going to be late. Mm -hmm. so, you know, things, things like that. You describe the situation, not the personality flaw of your partner. Mm -hmm. And step three, you say what you do need, not what you don't want or don't like or resent. So altogether, it's going to sound like this. I'm upset that the kitchen is a mess. Would you please clean it up tonight? Or I'm really worried that the bills haven't been paid. Would you please pay them this evening? That positive need is so important because what you're doing is you're giving your partner a concrete way to shine for you. Mm -hmm. And most of us do want to shine for our partners. We're just not sure how. So the more concrete and positive that need can be stated, the better in terms of your partner saying, oh my God, I'm not being criticized. Yeah, I can pay the bills tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll pay the bills. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what a difference between you never pay the bills and would you pay the bills? That's right. Yeah. I think yeah. another thing, Karen, that we can do as individuals is about what we, what we do when we're not together. Mm. Really, when we think about our partner, and this comes from the researcher, Carol Rusbolt, over 30 years of research on commitment, is cherish what we have with our partner and nurture gratitude rather than thinking about what's missing in our partner. Mm -hmm. and resentment for what's missing so that it's a choice and if you nurture gratitude for what you have you're also and Russell found this more likely to give voice to your problems with that person to that person rather than go to a third party and complain about your partner to that other person mm -hmm. and so you know, that's something that you do when you're alone. And I, I think about that every day. When, even when I'm not with Julie, I often think, boy, I am lucky to have her in my life. And I think about all these great qualities about her that I wouldn't have in my life if it weren't for her. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it really helps me to see what I have and how lucky I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, nobody's perfect. I mean, you know, there are lots of reasons she could be disappointed in me. And yet, you know, they don't become that important to her. She thinks more about, you know, what I have to offer in the relationship. So that's a kind of, that kind of cherishing is something we can do as an individual. Now, if we express that cherishing to our partner, it's even better. <laughs> then, then you get the good coffee every day when you express it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a great example, John, of something that one can do in the privacy of their own head is, you know, and heart 
is experience the gratitude, be conscious of that. And it probably does change the emotional connection even without any words being spoken or without the intention of a conversation. What we discover in, in the laboratory is that when you have that as a habit of mind, mm -hmm. you stick to the habit of mind. So instead of scanning your social world for your partner's mistakes and trying to correct them, you mm -hmm. scan your social world for what's going right, as Julie mentioned. And this wonderful study by Robinson and Price that was done in the 80s found that in unhappy relationships, people actually miss 50% of the positive things that their partner is actually doing. Wow. They just don't see it. And when people started designing couples therapies, they just assumed that unhappy couples weren't doing nice things for their partner. But Robinson and Price found they were, but their partner was just not noticing it. So that habit of mind of noticing what's going right is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. That's something you do as an individual. Yep, I love it. That's great. Thank you. We, um, I've just gotten a text, a question from the audience. That's how we're doing this virtual. So let me bring that voice in if that's okay with you. Sure. Great. Great. So uh, one of our uh, participants in the conference today said, please address long distance relationships without physical or in-person contact during the pandemic, if possible. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you know, that's, gosh, there are so many couples where that has been the case um, because we live in the far North. I mean, we have seen a lot of couples where one person is living in Canada, the other person right. is Canada's in the closed. United States. Canada has been closed. Uh, you know, I, I think they're going to build a wall. <laughs> In fact, um, poor guys. So um, it's it's really been tough for couples who are living, you know, far apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So you know, thank God for technology. And um, again, you come back to rituals of connection. So how can you connect when you live far apart? Well through our wonderful online services and so on, we can uh, talk to one another. We can wake up together. We can watch movies together. We can say good night together. We can check in during the day together. Um, I think one of the things that uh, is really important is given that you're distant uh, physically from one another, to involve as many of the senses as mm. you can. Um, granted, you can't touch one another, you can't smell or taste one another, but you can see and you can hear. So the folks who are texting to each other, um, it's not going to be as effective. It's not going to feel as connected, and it's much easier to misunderstand the tone, the mood, the feeling of your partner's message. Uh, so very important, I think, to try to capture those little face times where you can actually see each other, talk to one another, put big lipstick marks, you know, of kisses all over your screen. That's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> and wipe it off. Uh, and make the, the contact um, as predictable as possible. I think that really helps. Something that you can count on, uh, like spending dinners together uh, if you can, or um, waking up, as I mentioned earlier. And then having conversations where, uh, like in our, our book, uh, Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, there are some really neat conversations uh, that are included in that book that explore at deeper levels who your partner is. And your partner, even if you've known them for a long time, for decades even, is going to evolve over time. And many of the discussions, the conversations that are guided in that book give you ways of understanding who is your partner here and now? Who are they today? Have they changed over time? Uh, 
Is their spirituality different? Is their ideal dream of how they want their life to be, has that changed? What do they think about trust and commitment? And what signals to them that a, you or a partner is trustworthy uh, or committed? So um, having those deeper, longer conversations as opposed to the quick little quips that one can do with text messaging uh, are really helpful in making a connection at a deeper level, even without being in the same space. Yeah, can I also recommend that one powerful thing that couples can do is breathing together. Mm -hmm. So in meditation, you know, you even your breathing, you have pace breathing where you're breathing about 10 times a minute. You can breathe together. You can cook the same meal, even though you're apart, and savor the same flavors together. Oh, cool. You can masturbate together. Mm -hmm. You can use uh, modern devices that are known as teledildonics. <laughs> you can actually have sex remotely with one another. So these are ways of really increasing connection, really mm -hmm. tends toward the more spiritual, but the, but the physical are also possible, the sensual are also possible, even though they're in different locations. Right, right. So that's great. Thank you for taking that, that question about the long distance relationships. We're, we're feeling for those who yeah. are, are both cooped up together and a sense of no escape. And we're also feeling for those who are lo longing to be with each other and aren't able to cross a border or cross a street. And um, both are very, very real. I was, I wanted to come back to the Eight Dates book that you mentioned, because it's a fascinating book. And um, in a way at the, the end of a pandemic is um, as a transition and any transition is an opportunity for a reset and, is, and a reprioritization as you opened with. And I, I'm wondering if you see the eight dates as one way that um, people might sort of take the opportunity to re be reflective about what um, what the before times were like, what the pandemic has been like, and and to then set some um, make some decisions together or set some intentions for the post pandemic life. Are there particular dates that you would say might help fuel that conversation? Yeah, I think so. Um, so one would be uh, a date on dreams. So dreaming is a great I knew one. you were going to say that. Of course. <laughs> I'm a big dreamer. Uh, so one on dreams, one on spirituality, uh, one on fun and play, and one on adventure. Um, I think that those are all really cool. And for couples who have been suffering over the last year in terms of their relationship, there's a chapter on conflict. Mm -hmm. That chapter I really like because mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, move you into having a conflict. Instead, it guides you to talk about what are the ways that you prefer to talk about differences mm -hmm. between you. How did your family deal with conflict? What did you like about that? What did you not like about that? Mm -hmm. What would make you feel safe in bringing up an issue now? Mm -hmm. um, so it's more of a process conversation to really understand the other person's needs and to speak your own regarding differences between you because, you know, inevitably couples have differences. Uh, and they need a way to talk about that that really ensures their safety. Yeah, we had 350 couples uh, record their dates uh, to field test these dates. And the most powerful one of all is the first date on trust and commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a very important thing to have post-COVID. Mm -hmm. you know, what can we do to trust each other better and to feel more committed to one another? That's a it, it seems a great structure for that resetting and potentially leading to, you know, is there something that we need to process that happened that was distressing 
Or is there something that we want to capture that was beautiful for us that we want to now continue into our post pandemic life? It, it, your, your dates allow both of those. And I think that's beautiful. I know we're coming up on time here. And of course I could talk to you about relationships forever. Um, but we won't take over the whole conference. We'll relinquish the main stage. But I did want to ask you if you had any um, any final advice for our our attendees today or those watching in the future who are really anxious to cultivate the quality of their relationships and their own hearts. Well, one thing I wanted to mention was something that came up in our conversation yesterday, getting ready for this, which was our aftermath of a positive event. Mm. To understand how to, you know, the anatomy of that positive event that happened between us and how to make that happen more often. Mm -hmm. So that's another tool that, you know, is like the aftermath of a regrettable incident, but, you know, is the flip side of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would want to offer, um, be grateful you're alive. Mm -hmm. Just be grateful you're alive. Uh, John and I both had COVID twice. Right. Not once, but twice. We we do everything in a big <laughs> so, uh, And I feel incredibly grateful that yeah, you made it. And that I made it. And so share, uh, we have a conversation with your partner where you talk about uh gratitude simply that you're still breathing you're still vertical you're still <laughs> in this life uh and um embrace one another yeah thank you that's beautiful beautiful advice and as you know my husband had it as well and i yeah, share sorry. the gratitude that he is here and that you are here and mm -hmm. we we know we're we know how fortunate we are and our hearts are with those who aren't as fortunate and who have lost mm -hmm. lost others and and there's a bit of you know given that we're here let's cherish it let's mm -hmm. let's really cherish and appreciate it i want to thank you too so much for your your wisdom your decades of research and then the joy that you bring to our conversation today and the great advice thank you thank you Karen. Karen, it's just been a pleasure just a pleasure to speak with you and to Get all to know of you yeah. wonderful people out there. Thank you so much for Thank you. Thanks, Soren, too, and Michelle. Absolutely, Soren and Michelle and the team, the team behind the screen. We appreciate all of you. And we'll we'll hand ourselves over to you. Thank you. Very good.